Our sermon text for this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 13. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say to them for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Then they asked him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah indeed is coming first to restore all things. How then is it written about the Son of Man that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written about him. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds this day. Create a pure spirit in us, O God, that you may speak to our hearts and you may give us the courage to act on your words. In your name we pray. Amen. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. In the church calendar year, it is known as the last Sunday of the Epiphany season, or the Sunday before the beginning of Lent. The scripture associated with the Transfiguration is told in the first three Gospels, and some believe that it is alluded to in John's Gospel as well. It is a story that involves Jesus and three of his disciples. Now at this point in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is beginning the road to Jerusalem. The events of the cross are beginning to unfold, and Jesus knows what he must face, and that that occurrence is getting closer and closer. He takes his inner circle of disciples with him, and he goes to the top of a high mountain, and there he is transfigured. His clothes become dazzling white, and he, can, he could be seen talking to Elijah and Moses. Peter is so moved by seeing Jesus transformed that he wanted to build dwelling places. He wanted to set up camp. He wanted to remain in that moment. He wanted to cherish that feeling. When the experience was over and Jesus and the disciples were coming down the mountain, Jesus warned them to tell no one of what had taken place. This is a great story. It is one full of drama. It is one that informs and teaches. It is one that speaks to our hearts today. Now I want to look at just two issues this morning. What happened on that mountain talk to Jesus and why the strict instruction to tell no one. 
Jesus was standing by himself on the mountain. Suddenly his garments became this dazzling white and he could be seen talking with two of the giants in Jewish history. Moses, the one who brought God's law to the people, and Elijah, the one who brought God's voice to the people. Now, we are not privy to what was said between the three of them. Quite possibly, it is possible that with the events of the cross ever looming, that these two were encouraging Jesus with what he was about to face. They were bestowing upon him a comfort that no matter the outcome, Jesus had the courage needed to persevere. A blessing that in his darkest moment, Jesus knew that God was with him. An assurance that what he was doing was the right thing at the right time for all the right reasons. And a peace that God's love and mercy and forgiveness would soon envelop and come to the whole world. The power and the compassion of God was on that mountain. It was in Moses and Elijah. It surrounded the disciples. It was with Jesus. It was Jesus. God's very presence was with his son to instill the needed courage to carry on to the cross and to see it through. So what brings you to the top of your mountain? Is it sickness? Is it the loss of a loved one? Is it cancer? Is it anger and fear and unfulfillment? Do you doubt? Do you worry? Do you wonder if you're doing all the right things for God? Are you on the mountaintop for courage, for assurance, for confidence, for time of decision, for faith? When Jesus met with Elijah and Moses, God gave him exactly what was needed, and God will give to each of us exactly what is needed. We are all going to find ourselves, for whatever reason, on that mountaintop. And as much as we don't want to face the harsh realities that are going to come our way, the mountaintop is a good thing. It is where we are in God's presence. It is an understanding that with God we can overcome. It is confirmation that we are doing the right things. It is comfort given to us as God's children. When needed, it is exactly where we should be. For Peter, that experience was to be in the glory of God, and it was something that he did not want to end. But it does end. Because the mountaintop moments inspire us to thrive and survive with the daily routines of life. Life is messy. And those moments in God's presence gives us the strength to clean up our mess. If Jesus got what he needed in his time on the mountain, and if Peter and the other disciples saw the glory of God, and if that experience was needed in a time to be in God's presence, then why did Jesus forbid the disciples to discuss this transfiguration with anyone? In our lives, we are supposed to tell people about the loving, miraculous things that God does for us. We have scripture to read and to relate to other peoples. We have missionaries that go all over the world telling and showing others about God's love. We build and we establish churches that invite people to become members and to live and help one another in Christian community. But when this incident happened, all were silent. What happened to Jesus on the mountaintop could have served as one of the greatest examples of God and God's love, and the disciples were forbidden to speak of it. My study Bible, the commentary section, says the following. It was difficult for the disciples to grasp the idea that their Messiah would have to suffer. The Jewish people who studied the Old Testament prophecies expected the Messiah to be a great king like David, one who would overthrow their enemies. Our understanding and appreciation for Jesus must go beyond the here and now. That's my life application Bibles. The disciples still had to learn what being the Messiah meant. It was not the great king who would burst into the scene vindicating God's people and destroying all their enemies, at least not the way that they envisioned. 
If Peter, James and John had told the people that on the mountaintop they had saw Jesus transfigured, that he was talking to Elijah and Moses, that they had experienced God's glory, all of this would have been taken as a sign that the Messiah was ready to burst into history. Part of the belief was that before the Messiah came, Elijah would come and be the herald or the forerunner. That was the sign. Jesus knew that that sign had happened. It had happened in John the Baptist. Jesus enjoined the disciples from sharing their mountaintop experience because they did not understand what Messiah meant. And the only way that could occur was to go through the cross and the resurrection. And this is a great story for us because for us living today, the transfiguration is important to our faith because unlike the disciples, we get the best of both worlds. We get that mountaintop experience. We get to stand in God's presence. We get to see God working in our lives to see and bring forth God's glory. And we know what the Messiah is all about. It is our powerful and mighty God who is full of love and kindness. The Messiah is the one who rescues us from our enemies by teaching about forgiveness and mercy. It is our King who delivers us from the harshness of life by giving us the courage to endure our challenges. The Messiah is the one who delivers us from our enemies, our troubles, our sins, and ourselves. This is not a one-time event, but a daily journey that can last for all of eternity. We get the best of both worlds. Now, I'm going to push my luck today. And I'm going to push it with you by telling yet another Paul Harvey story. <laughs> I promise I will not do this next Sunday. The fact that Debbie's preaching has nothing to do with it. I promise that I will stop at two. But this is another Paul Harvey story, and it's, uh, it's about a lady named Terry Schaefer and her husband, David. It takes place in September of 1977 in a, uh, a small town in Illinois. And... and it's about a woman who wanted to buy for her husband the perfect Christmas gift, and that in itself becomes the rest of the story. So she's out shopping in September of 1977. She goes into her town. She goes to the little corner shop on Fifth Avenue. She knows what she's looking for, and in that store, she finds it. And she's elated. It's exactly what he needs. It's what she wants to give him. It's nothing he is expecting. It's going to make his face light up on Christmas morning. So she goes to the, the, the man behind the counter, who in this case is probably the owner of the store. It's a small town. And she says, uh, this is what I want. And he says, it's perfect. It's, it's the latest. It's got the best of everything. It hits all the styles and everything you want. I'm sure your husband will love it. And with the biggest smile on her face, she asks how much, and the man says $120 in 1977. And the smile and the blood drain out of her face because it's just too much. She doesn't work. Her husband's a young policeman. $120 is more they'll spend on the entire Christmas, and she can't do it. And so she says to the store owner, I'm sorry, as much as I want, I can't, I can't do it. And as she's leaving, she gets a thought that pops into her head. And she says, I was wondering, could you put it aside for me so that no one else can buy it? And if I save up my pennies and, and do a little creative economics, I may be able to raise the money between now and Christmas. And he said, I'm sorry, I will not put that aside for you. And you will not leave the store today without it. You take it and you pay me when you raise the money. And so her plan is back in place. She's driving home. The plan is to wrap it up, to put it in a room, and to surprise him on Christmas morning. But the man in the store was so kind, and he went out of his way so that she could have it today. Why couldn't she give it to him today? 
So she goes home and she makes a nice dinner and she presents him with the present and it's exactly what she thought it was and all is right with the world. We now move to October 1977 and David is working the night shift and he gets a call that there's a robbery in progress and he pulls up just as the robber is driving away. And so he gives chase. And the car goes three blocks, pulls off to the side of the road and stops. And so this young policeman approaches with caution because this is the robber. He's still in the car. The car is still running. So he orders the man out of the car with his hands up nice and slow. The door opens. The man jumps out of the car, is about three feet from the officer, and puts a 45 caliber bullet in his stomach. And he goes down. And now we learn about another policeman, about seven hours later, who has to go to Terry's house and tell her. She, she, she has to know the events of what happened. And as he's standing on the doorstep, and as he's telling her, the only thing she can think about is that gift. The only thing that enters into her mind are all the events of that day. Of, of how she had to have it and how she had to wait to Christmas and how she got to that day and how she gave it to him that night and how this and how that and so on and so forth. And that's what was going through her head because that gift was a brand new, say it with me, bulletproof vest. And all he got from that was a bruise about the size of the state of Ohio. And they lived happily ever after as these stories go. Now, Paul Harvey didn't print and write and say this story to show you the glory of God and how God works miraculous things in our life and how God is with us. That wasn't the point of the story. But it's the point of the story for me because I'm not a big believer in coincidences. And that's a mountaintop experience. And miracles happen all the time because God is with us and active in our lives. And I wish I could answer all the questions and solve all the mysteries. I don't know why bad things happen to good people. I don't know why the innocent suffer and all of these things happen. And most of the time when it happens to us, it is not fair. But I do know that those who give to God, those who do their best to live out God's purpose, gets God's glory gets God's mountaintop experiences and gets to know their Messiah one-on-one -on -one in their hearts. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us. Help us to live. Help us to overcome the difficulties that we must face. Help us to feel your love now and always. Amen.